It's good to be with you guys today, Resonate. Um, I am excited about this, this content that we're going through. Uh, as, as we've heard, we're going through um, 1 Timothy. And as we think about 1 Timothy, uh, really what this is, is just talking about how the church was formed around the mission of God. So we took this, uh, this spring and early in this, uh, this kind of summer into this context of Acts, finished that up, and now we're talking about really how is it the church was organized around this. And... Um, and if you think about um, just being here and you're trying to figure out what does this have to do with my life? I had a, a, a difficult week or I had a, a tough time uh, in, in just living life. And so what does it look like for us to talk about the leadership of the church and why is that relevant? I think that's a really good question. And I think that every time you come to church, um, you should be asking, how does this apply to my life and why is this relevant? And um, specifically when we get into this, it can kind of feel like we're getting into the nitty gritty of, of kind of how the church works. But I want to tell you how I believe this is really important for us to be able to, to dive into this and why it's important for us um, to really latch onto this way of thinking. Uh, and really that's because, let me just paint it this way, is because everyone needs a family around them and not just a nuclear family, not just your biological family, um, but a significant group of community around them um, that is there. And, and what does that look like and, and how is that supposed to act and how are we supposed to, to, to kind of carry ourselves and what should we expect of each other? Um, I, I believe believe that one of the most significant things in this world is loneliness, and that's one of the most significant factors against our happiness uh, and against our satisfaction in life is us just feeling isolated and feeling lonely. But when we think about what it looks like for us to have connection and what it looks like for us to have real community, Oftentimes what happens is we have this idea in our head about what that looks like, and we continue to search all of our life to say, this is what I think I'm after. But the problem is, is there's a lot of deception that we actually incur in that context. And we don't really know what we need. Um, and, and that ultimately sends us on a futile search for that. And we kind of end up in this place where we just get uh, later in life just really frustrated sometimes. Um, and, and we think, hey, I wish, I, I thought I would be more connected. I thought I would have deeper friends. I thought there would be people around me that were my kind of people around me in this kind of kind of context. Um, and I want to press us into this scripture uh, today because I think that this has something to say to us and about what the family looks like. And so um, I'm, I'm talking to you, our Resonate family. I want to talk to us about the family dynamics that we have. And I really want to talk to us about what God has orchestrated um, in terms of what our family should look like and, and where they should be in our lives. This week, um, my wife and I started off uh, and we were going to uh, vacation in a few days. And um, as we were headed to vacation, um, we were about seven miles from our destination. And uh, uh, we, we took a turn on the road, and all of a sudden, this car came at high speed and, uh, and clipped the side of our, our van, um, ended up totaling our vehicle. Um, and it was, a, it was a scary moment, right? So we pulled over. Uh, their car went into a ditch. We, we, we you know, got out and immediately just started hugging people. Like, it was this kind of bizarre thing, like we're trying to figure out what's going on, not, not not necessarily our family, we're hugging them. And, they, and like, it was just all of a sudden, we got bonded by this, uh, this very scary moment. Um, but you know, immediately when I began to realize um, that everyone in my van was okay, all my kids were okay, um, nobody was, was, was seriously hurt and bleeding on the scene, um, it, was this, it was this moment to try to figure out, okay, there's a tragedy, there's something that's significant that happened in my life. Um, so we're, we're headed to vacation, that might be ruined, we're, oh, this van obviously uh, can't continue uh, in this way, What's it's going to happen. And, uh, and we begin to kind of assess the whole thing. And after the cops came and after all that kind of got settled out, there was still, still this reality that my life had changed just a little bit, right? Um, the plans that I had um, were no longer going to be the exact same plans that I had, you know, uh, thought about months on end uh, before we got to this context. But here's this thing, uh, as I began to interact just a little bit with these, uh, this group of people, um, there was a significant group of people uh, that were there, and we were trying to figure out um, between what we were going to do, what they were going to do. But here's what I knew. Um, I, I knew that um, whatever it was that was going to t transpire and whatever we needed, that there's a group of people, right? There's, there's a, a community of people. And if I needed something, that they were going to be there. And, and sure enough, one of the tires on my vehicle didn't, uh, didn't function, so I had to call somebody to, to come and bring me a tire. Uh, and, and that just really wasn't a big deal, right? Because this is what family does. This is what community does. And it was that moment that I began to realize that this thing that God's created, this thing that we're all a part of, um, in, in the 
circumstances that we don't even realize, right? Um, that we're building something incredibly beautiful and we're building something that's uncommon and we need to build it right. And we need to make sure that we're orienting the kind of thing that the church is supposed to be, uh, that in the body of Christ, we're functioning the way that we ought to function. And this is a beautiful thing and it's intended to be a beautiful thing. But as you've understood that there's oftentimes what we call church baggage, and that is using something that God intended to be very beautiful in, in a very dirty way, in a very difficult way. And, and oftentimes we've been wounded by this. And so I want to step into something that I believe has the opportunity in each of our lives to fulfill a deep need in our, in our lives. And I want to talk about this church leadership in, in a context where it's been tainted in, in many ways. It's been messed up in many ways. Um, but I want to paint a picture of what I desire for our church and what I desire for us in our family dynamic and what I want to ask you to step into both in a leadership role and in a submission role. And so this is a tricky thing. This is an extension of the thought that we ultimately started back in at, or sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 2, which we walked through um, uh, talking about ladies and, and women and, and what they kind of roles in that. And that's a touchy subject and a very difficult thing. But this is kind of the other side of that and, and the other context of this as we talk about um, a continuation of what it looks like in terms of order and in terms of what this should look like. And so we're going to get into this, and, uh, and I hope that we can begin to really begin to understand what the church is intended to be and really what this community of Christ is intended to look like in our midst. So here's, here's where we're at. In chapter 3, verse 1, we're going to walk through this um, about, about 13 verses, uh, and I'm just going to try to unpack these, these truths and help us to understand what they mean. And so here it is, the first verse of that. It says this, here's a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. And I want to just stop right there because anytime you see this idea um, right here in terms of this idea of a, a trustworthy saying, right? Uh, every now and then, this is what Paul says to get your attention around this idea. So when we begin to say, here's a trustworthy saying, uh, really what he's trying to do is call attention to this next idea that's coming up. He's trying to make sure that the people around this, and, and we're talking about these, this church in Ephesus that Timothy is leading. And, um, and by all means, this is kind of this crazy church, right? Um, evidently, um, there's just a lot of uh, slander that's going on. And, and then we'll find out a little bit, there's like drunken leaders. Um, and I don't know what that looks like, but there's just all kinds of crazy stuff. But he's saying this, he, he's trying to draw our attention, trying to clarify to Timothy and trying to, by extension, clarify to all of the rest of these people in Ephesus. Um, here's what we need to understand. And it's kind of a strange idea. It says, whoever aspires um, to be an over, overseer desires, and we begin to see this, this idea of this noble task, this, this, this idea that whatever this, this, this thing is, it is to be pursued. And when we begin to understand what this means to pursue this, and we begin to understand what it means to chase after this, we begin to understand what really um, Paul is talking about. And because uh, in, the, in, the, in the idea at the very beginning to, for someone to say, hey, do you want to be in charge? Most people would say, yes, yes, I want to be in charge, right? That that's the kind of the natural idea is that we desire to have power. And that's one of the things that draws us a temptation for us. So why would then Paul help us to, to be able to point towards this? Um, and, and I want you to get this is really important. Um, the desire to take spiritual responsibility to lead the people around you is something that we should all aspire to. This is something for us to aspire to. Some in a formal role, some in an informal role. We're going to be talking about that formal role of overseer in this context today. But for us to be able to say leadership needs to happen in our church, leadership needs to happen in our community, that we can't have this kind of uh, this crazy no rules kind of understanding of this, that this, when we begin to say step into the responsibility to spiritually lead people, that is a desirable task. And I want you to begin to get in your head that God wants you to step into to appropriate roles of leadership. Like this is what allows for human flourishing, for us to begin to see this. And, and, and I want you to get that this is not just uh, a position, but, but we need to understand this is a task, right? This is, I don't, understand, I don't know if we always understand exactly what we're being called to in this, but it's saying this, that for you to be able to say, I, I want this, this is really clear. And so 
Here's, here's what I want us to, to look at and be able to understand. I want to back up from this to be able to help you to understand why Paul is helping us to understand this and why this is very important. And, and this, is, this is one of the things. It's this. It's because one of the primary characteristics of God is order. So that it, and we begin to think about the family dynamics of the church. We begin to think about what God has done in this. One of the things this entire passage is trying to help us to understand is that God desires for us to be an ordered people because he is an ordered God. That this is one of the primary things for us to understand. Is this of the, uh, of the Lord? Is this something that points back to an intelligent being? Is this something that God created and designed? That, that, that God desires order not chaos, that God desires this, um, this understanding of, of really helping us to say there is a plan and there's a way for this to work. And, and let me say, this is really important for us to understand that this starts with the character of God, that the principle here is that the character of God is an ordered God who gives to his people an ordered way for us to have the dynamics of the church. So uh, just for you to, to, to get this, um, and, and for us to all be clear, there's an underlying and subtle um, shift against leadership, really uh, spiritual leadership of leadership of any kind in our, in our world. And, and I think that this is where it comes from, that there's a very real fear to completely opening oneself up to another person's leadership. And you may have experienced this kind of leadership that didn't result in your flourishing, but instead in, in resulted in pain and in hurt. And so oftentimes what we do is we try to subvert leadership, we try to undercut leadership, we try to get into contexts that, that there aren't leadership, and there's not the demand for us to submit to that leadership, right? But I want you to get that all throughout the Bible, what is very clear is that God is an ordered God. In the family, we begin to see this uh, of leadership and submission. We begin to see this in the church of leadership and submission. This is all a part of God's plan. And it goes back from the idea that God is creating order out of chaos. And that's a fundamental idea. And so let me, if maybe you're here and you're like, I'm not sure if I actually believe that. Let me, let me go about this a little bit differently. Let me help you to understand, um, even as we begin to look at the cosmos, we begin to look at the characteristic of God and the world around us, and the ordered world around us. And I took a quote um, out of an out of article by Eric Metaxas talking just about the intelligent design of an ordered God. And it says this, Alter any one value in the universe could not exist. For instance, if the ratio between the nuclear strong force and the electromagnetic force had been off by the tiniest fraction of the tiniest fraction, by even one part in that huge number there, then no stars could have ever formed at all. Multiply that single parameter by all the other necessary conditions and the odds against the universe existing are so heart-stoppingly astronomical that the, notion, uh, that the notion that it all just happened defies common sense. It would be like tossing a coin and having it comes up, come up heads. 10 quintillion times in a row. All right, let's, let's just keep going with that. Fred Hoyle, the astronomer who coined the term the Big Bang, said that this atheism was greatly shaken by this idea of an ordered God, right? At these developments, he later wrote that a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with the physics as well as with the chemistry and biology. The numbers, the, num uh, the numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. All right? So if we begin to look around and we begin to see that there's an ordered world in the physics, there's an ordered world in the, in the, in the cosmos, there's an ordered, ordered world in, in the chemistry around us, and that this was all created by God for human flourishing. So would not it also make sense that God would communicate to his people the crown of his creation that he has given an ordered world in order to create an ordered people for their own flourishing. Okay? So we look around and see order. We look at God who created order out of chaos. We look at God who's done all of this stuff, and then we look into the Bible, and it specifically talks about the order that we should operate out of. And yet we're not afraid in the physics of sitting in a chair, but we are deeply afraid oftentimes of submitting ourselves to leadership in the community of Christ. And sometimes we are scared of stepping into that leadership in the community of Christ. And what I want to ask us is to do that very thing in response to this idea that it is a noble task 
for us to do this. That it is God's desire for us to create an ordered world around this. That humans don't flourish without leadership and order. And for us to step into this and to understand what this means is a significant task for us on this order. For us to understand this, we need to understand that leadership and submission are part of human flourishing, that God desires to be glorified because he is good, right? This is the the entire act of worship, right? Leadership and submission is worship. So we just sang a few songs to begin this, right? And this is this idea that from the very beginning, out of God's character, worship And the understanding of submission is is a part of the whole thing, right? And as we begin to see him giving his his, uh, sense of task and mission to his people, that same kind of order should uh, ultimately ultimately be seen in this. And and we don't worship one another. We worship only God. So I don't want to take that too far. But I need you to get that this is a fundamental characteristic of God before we really unpack this and understand what he's asking us to do. What we need to understand is, is that this idea that stems at the very heart of God is based upon a benevolent leadership and willing submission that work for the good of all people. Now, those are really key things because horrible leadership and unwilling submission, right, or lack of submission, uh, th- this is what creates chaos, Right? So no one trusts each other, so no one wants to ultimately allow um, someone to speak into their life with any kind of truth. But the good of the people, benevolent leadership and willing submission are the thing that creates order and chaos and human flourishing. So not chaos, sorry. Order and human flourishing, right? So in this, um, what do we see in the Bible? So when everyone does what is right in their own eyes is the characteristic phrase of when people don't have um, submission to God and submission to the leaders that God has appointed. So this is a significant reality. We're going to unpack this as we go. So when we begin to see this, I want to give you just a couple of facts, and we're going to go on. I'm not going to spend all this time on every verse, right? But, but I need you to get there's two things that war against um, leadership and, and, and order. The first thing, let's talk about order. When we begin to say um, God is a God of order, but in our context, When we remove objective truth and say all things are relative, right? So you pick whatever way you want to uh, live your life. So your way to live life and your own morality and what is right is, is up to you. What that creates is a chaotic world. And we begin to see a chaotic world. So all you have to do is, is, is get on social media, you get on the news, right? All you see is, is chaos because what we have done is not lined up with this idea of order around the principles that God has set out for us, but we've chosen our own ideas. So ultimately what happened is the removal of objective cr- truth creates disorder, and that ultimately does not lead to human flourishing. So whenever you think about, um, should I just say, hey, do whatever you want to do, it doesn't matter matter to anyone. What you're actually saying is that the chaotic idea that seems easy in that moment is really not allowing for human flourishing, but to fight for something that is an objective truth based upon the, the, the rules and the truths of who God is, is always ultimately going to lead to her human flourishing. What it doesn't always lead to is do whatever you want. And so initially we push back on this, right? And so it seems fine, but it leads to something that is chaotic and not something that flourishes. I need you to have the worldview for the world around you to be able to understand what's going on so that you begin to see the easy way out is saying, hey, you do what you do, I do what I do. But that never leads to something that is ultimately benefiting all of us. The second thing is, when we talk about leaderlessness, two things. One is this, uh, a passivity towards leadership. There's, there's, um, there's all kinds of books that are talked about today uh, and, and ideas is this idea of where the leaders, right? So even, even in the last 50 years, talking about um, the, the lack of leadership in our businesses, the lack of leadership in our civic um, endeavors, um, just the lack of leadership, um, it's this really epidemic of uh, significant proportions. When we talk about, I'm not going to step into the line of fire to be able to lead out. In fact, I'm going to step back and let someone else take, a, take the bullet, right? Because when leadership gets hard, I'd rather us just to do something that's just a little more easy. And I want you to say, what, what Paul, see, is, is this what Paul is saying is something that is very difficult. You're going to take some bullets in terms of spiritual leadership, but this is to be aspired to and not be passive in, right? So we go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, right? 
Adam was passive in this. That leadership that is passive does not lead to human flourishing. The second thing is, is the lack of submission. If there's no one to lead because everyone says, I'm not going to allow you to lead me, then there's no opportunity for leadership. That's the other side of leaderlessness, right? Is it's not that there's not a leader, but there's not people to follow. There's not someone that says, I'm going to allow someone to lead me. So this is the passivity to lead and the arrogance to say, I'm not going to allow anyone to lead me. Those are the two things that fight against human flourishing and should not be present in the community of Christ called the church. So we need spiritual leaders. Here, here's what this is going to end up. That we need more spiritual leaders to create more families on mission, right? And, and I'm talking about biological families and small groups, more churches. The more leaders that we have that assume spiritual authority over people that say, we're going to take and extend the kingdom of God, this multiplies and it changes our culture and it changes all of us, what's around us for us to begin to say, what happens is ultimately the kingdom of God waits upon leaders to be able to assume leadership in the kingdom of God. And let me just give you just the, this hint again. When we walk through the book of Acts, you need to understand that God is at work that God has it all rigged, that God's mission is, is waiting upon the leaders to carry out his mission, right? So we're gonna get into this and there's very little in terms of competency that is required in this. It is all a part of character to be able to say, can you handle the leadership? Because God's gonna make something happen through you and God's gonna make something happen where the kingdom of God is going to be expanded, but he waits on leaders to be able to step into that place and be able to assume that mantle, to be able to assume that weight to go. So this is the context that when we say aspire to the role of leadership, ultimately we're talking about the kingdom of God being expanded in our towns, in our campuses, in our communities. And this is a beautiful thing, to be able to see the reign of the kingdom of God be present because the people, men specifically, are aspiring to be overseers and aspiring to say, I'm gonna take responsibility that the kingdom of God begins to be implanted in the people around me and expanded in the people around them. All right, that was a lot on one verse, right? So. Might have been a record. All right, so now this next thing, let's talk about this. What we talked about the reality is the problem is not that there is necessarily a desire um, to be led. It's really a distrust in leadership. And so we're going to see Paul outline what this means and what it looks like for us to be able to see what a leader in the church is to be like. And it says this, now the overseer is to be above reproach. The overseer is, oops, let me go back. Now, the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. In this, as we begin to see um, these words being used, this is, that, um, this is that helpful understanding of how do you trust somebody that you submit yourself to. That you begin to see something in scripture that is helping us to understand what it is that you're being asked to submit to, to be able to help us lead. And for those of you who aspire to be this kind of leader, this is what, this is what Paul's asking you to be, and this is no easy task. This is not something that it's just, hey, assume all the good things and, and, and get all the privileges of this, but there's some very difficult things in this. So when we talk about this, this idea, it says above, oops, it says above reproach. This idea of above reproach. Uh, if you're to think about, there's a standard, right? And, and the overseers to operate above the standard where they don't get close to being, having questionable behavior, right? They don't get close to saying, hey, this is, this is the standard. But when we talk about above reproach, we're talking about living in a way that there's no question. Living in a way that's not like, I have to explain myself out of this. If you oftentimes have to explain yourself to the people around you, you are likely not living above reproach. What this means is that there's not even a question about your life because it's not close enough to the, to the gray areas for you to be able to have someone speak in mouth like, I'm not exactly sure, right? And, and, and when you're looked at from the outside and maybe somebody doesn't know you, this idea of being able to say, I'm going to submit to their leadership, you have to be above reproach. You have to live a life that doesn't look questionable. And, and so this means a significant thing. This means there are things that you say, this is okay for me to do, but I'm going to give up my right to do this in order that I might live an unquestioned life. Again, this is why Paul said this is a, this is a noble task that you might be able to say, I want to be such a man of integrity that I would give up the things that I have rights to do in order for me to be able to make sure that I am a trustworthy person. 
so that you begin to say, this area right in, in between there, we don't flirt with that stuff. And this is what you younger men sometimes don't get. You begin to say, I, I didn't quite get, you know, it wasn't quite that bad. But you don't understand it's close enough for people not to trust you. And when you're tasked with being this kind of person, this kind of leader, there's no margin for you to create question in the people around you. Now, again, they are to trust, but you are not ever to give someone a reason not to trust you if you are in any kind of leadership in, in, in a Christian household or a Christian church. It says this, not only that, it says faithful to his wife, faithful to his wife. Again, here's where we see some of the clarity of um, this being reserved for, uh, for, for men. And this is very, very key. I, I want to take just a little bit of time on this. This, this clarification is so important. We've seen all, all, all through the, this, this thing about how this ordered understanding is for men to be able to, to carry this out. But when spiritual leaders live questionably towards other women, it is absolutely devastating. When anyone lives in a spirit of submission, the leader must never use this circumstance to their benefit. I want you to make sure that you hear this because there's nothing that I hate more than this kind of behavior from church leaders. And we have to be vigilant about this. That when we begin to understand that the, the intimacy of the marriage is not violated by any kind of leadership in the church. That, that this is a heinous thing and we need to protect that because this is, this is not just, um, hey, this, that was kind of a questionable thing, but you're, you're messing with the thing that God created at the very core of who the church is. And, and so what we need to make sure is that the faithfulness to wives and, and the faithfulness to not make any kind of a display of any kind of questioning behavior uh, towards anyone who is not our wife is, is key. One of the things uh, that, that I do and I ask our, our pastoral staff to do is we don't ride in a car uh, with a woman that's not our wife alone. So we're not in, in a room with a woman who's not our wife alone. And, uh, and this is something that is just in, in part so we can begin to, to have the kind of above reproach life. And so just uh, a few weeks ago, I was, uh, I was at San Diego. I had to get from one project to another. And, and the person that was going back to that was a, uh, was a single woman. And so one of the leaders on the project said, hey, Keith, I know this is what you do. Let me ride back with you. And he stayed the night in my room um, outside of his, uh, outside of his um, uh, project, just in order for us to make sure that his pastor wasn't in a place that compromised. Uh, there's places where it just is unavoidable in, in that kind of context. I call my wife and say, here's the situation. I want you to know this. Uh, but I want you to know our leaders. This is what we're, what we're desiring to do. This is what we're trying to be in order that this might be accomplished in us. And, and I want to speak to you guys. If you're in an a, a overseer kind of role as a village leader, if you're in that kind of place and you're single and you say, oh, I don't have a wife, I, I want to speak to you and I want to say this. I think that one day you're going to want a wife, right? And maybe right now you want a wife. And, and maybe that's part of this whole thing. Like you're, you're desiring, right? You, you, don't, have, you don't, have, don't have a desire for a wife. You just don't have one. You haven't snagged the girl yet, right? You're on the hunt. You're on the prowl. But you, you just hasn't, you haven't sealed the deal yet. So what do you do in this? I, I need you to understand this. I need you to operate towards uh, the women around you as if you are married. Think about that girl. Maybe you know her. You don't, maybe you don't know her. Maybe you have a picture of her in, in your head. Um, maybe it's an incorrect picture of really who you're going to get. But um, I want you to think about this idea that you need to be faithful to her and not do anything now that if, if the context were, were immediate and you were, you were married, that, that you would say that would be in violation or that would be questionable in light of that as well. So you need to operate already in the context of being able to have faithfulness to that not only that, it says, it says these two words with the word temperate and self-controlled, right? Those are these words to talk about this idea that there's no context in your life that you're allowing the pull of something else around you to be able to, to, to change your decision-making or your objectivity or your ability to have good leadership. So you are self-controlled. That this means that the hobbies don't, um, don't distract you. This, this means that um, temptations don't own you in this. That means that you aren't uh, owned by any sin. But, but not only that, is, is sometimes good things that turn into ultimate things that actually end up being bad things, right? 
so that when you begin to operate in a way that, that sets something else above your leadership of other people, then that begins to be something that you're not self-controlled in or not, you're not temperate in, right? So that you begin to operate in some sort of stability in this kind of way. What we're talking about this is protecting the people around you. And if the people around you cannot be protected from your desires, you're in no capacity to lead them. It says this, respectable. We'll see this kind of over and over, this idea of just being able to say, are, are they respectable? Oftentimes if we just use the word, are they respectable? Sometimes we can figure out who fits this and who doesn't fit, fit this. Uh, hospitable, right? Here's another understanding of this. And this is kind of an interesting thing, like um, uh, really do they need to be hospitable? And it goes back to this reality that oftentimes in the home, in our homes are the most potent opportunities for us to disciple the people around, for us to lead. It's the most um, disarming kind of thing that we have. And to be able to invite people in, and, and, and especially if you have a family, right, and you can model what it is for parenting, um, and, and we're in some ways spiritual parents, right? And for you to be able to invite people in and help you to watch your everyday life is a significant thing to help people to understand, hey, this is what it looks like for us to be able to lead out in the people around us. So when you say, what does it look like for you to be an overseer, to, to be able to lead out in people, for them to be able to see all parts of your life, for you not to say, not, this is not this is the church me and this is the work me, um, but, but this is all of me and the family too, right? In the most uh, significant and laid back posture of your life that you would invite people into this. And here's the last part to this. This is this most interesting thing, this idea of able to teach. This is the one thing that we begin to see is an actual um, competency, the, the, everything else, I mean, everything else we're going to be talking about is is a character, uh, is a character trait. But this is a competency. When we begin to see what this looks like, I want us to get um, that this. When we talk about uh, able to teach. We're not talking about um, this context that we're in right now. So that limits a lot of people, and, and I believe that the Western Church. Has, has limited the amount of leadership for many, many people to be able to be spiritual leaders because they've said, hey, you have to have this ability to teach. And in their mind, they think preaching in front of hundreds of people, preaching in front of uh, masses of people and being able to be a, a, a articulate and being able to be a, a teacher of things in a, in a monological form. And I just need you to get that when we see this being written, they're meeting in houses, this is just like our villages. This is like our house churches, right? So what it's talking about is you need to be able to communicate scripture in a way that's coherent and the way that is um, uh, able to be understood. And that when people are on the other side of your teaching, they begin to learn who God is and what God is about. It's that simple. It doesn't, doesn't mean preaching, right? It doesn't mean to, to be able to have uh, uh, this kind of context. It means that when people around you, they begin to, to actually learn who God is because you have an ability to communicate who God is. Really, let's go back all the way to the Great Commission, right? So Jesus says, hey, here's what you're supposed to do with your life. You're, go, therefore, and teach. So it really means all of us have a part in the discipleship role, that people around us should be learning more about who God is. Um, but this should be specifically a part of what it means to be in the role of an overseer. It also says this, not given to drunkenness. You know, this is written to a specific time, and, and we're going to see you talking about the deacons in just a minute. And I don't know what's going on, right? Um, but, but evidently there was some... Uh, there was some boozing it up at church, right? So there were some guys that were getting on stage and, and, and stumbling around a little bit. Um, I don't know how that is. Maybe they're just like tasting all the uh, communion stuff like that. This, was, this tastes exactly like the body of Jesus, right? So um, I tried them all. I don't know how that's going to work. But uh, so here's this context of not giving to drunkenness, right? Not allowing any kind of exterior thing to influence your decision making. That's a big deal. Like we need to understand what it, what it means for us to say, hey, this is a specific thing. Um, we're, we're talking about something that is relevant in our context for us to be able to talk about how are we, uh, what's our relationship with alcohol and how does it affect our ability uh, to, to think right um, and to be able to act right and have our desires in check. And then we begin to see this, this, this idea here of, uh, of not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome. And these are things, uh, again, that are beginning to say you, a leader, an overseer, has to be someone who is protecting the people around them, and they cannot be someone who is fear-mongering, someone who is, who is a threat of violence, threat of, of, of quarrel. This is, this is that heavy-handed thing. And oftentimes, um, when this is really displayed badly, um, this is one of the things that is subtly off, that there's a violence in speech, 
right? There's a violence in behavior. There's, there's even this, this violence in, uh, and not just in terms of uh, just a physical violence, but, but even an emotional kind of thing that is unsafe for the people around them. There has to be a safety um, around it. And this has to be something where this person is promoting peace in there. They're not quarrelsome, but they're promoting a peacefulness in this, that, that around them, that they are, they are not accelerating the quarrels because this is what's going to happen. There's going to be these things that happen among, uh, in our church, just like families, right? If you're around my family, it is, it is, it is Paige and I often being the referee, you know, and trying to figure out what's going on here, right? But when we begin to, as parents, add to that, yeah, that was wrong, you know? You have every right to kick them, right? Um, try it again, Carter. Hit him in the face, right? That is not helpful, right? And they're like, they're looking at us with wide eyes, like, really, I can do that? Because it's like a half a second before they just start loading off on each other, right? So this is, this is not helpful for us to escalate things as leaders, but to be able to bring peace, and this is all throughout Scripture. This last one, too, it says this, not... Not a lover of money. Not a lover of money. Let, let me just make sure that we get to see this really clearly here. Because when we begin to see these words, a lover of money, um, out of all the things I, I think that sometimes disqualify people from, from doing this in subtle ways, uh, we, we can look around and, and the culture and the Bible speak to um, not being a quarrelsome person. The culture and the Bible speaks to not being a violent person. Uh, the culture and the violent may say, hey, if you're drunk all the time, you're going to lose your job. It's just not going to work out very well for you. But the one thing that our culture has nothing to do with that the Bible speaks very specifically about is this idea of the, being a lover of money. And so when we expect the leaders around us and leaders and we begin to think about who we, are should, we, we should be, I think this excludes more people than we realize. Because here's what we're really talking about. It's not that you should have no money. It's not that you should not uh, use your money on, on, on things that are beyond your, your needs. But this is the reality. When you put your money first for your own sake versus saying, I'm, I, get, I have this money and I get to use it for God's kingdom and not my kingdom. Uh, that's, the, that's the difference, right? Is that when we begin to say, how is it that what I've been given as a gift by God to earn money gets used for God's purposes first and for my purposes second? And when we begin to get that clarity, then we begin to be someone who can lead others to that. But when we begin to say, I have a, a desire for myself to be enriched first from what I have, and then secondarily to give to God, we can't lead the people of God. Because we can never speak to that which we don't follow ourselves, at least without being a hypocrite. So one of the things that Jesus speaks most to is the love of money and how that begins to wreck our hearts. And so for us, we need to make sure that we understand we give to God first, we give to ourselves second. And when we begin to understand that hierarchy, then we can be entrusted to lead the people around God in this kind of way. We keep going, it says this. This is really fascinating because it brings these two collisions uh, of these things together. It says this, he must manage his own family well and see, his children, see that his children obey him. I, I say this to my kids all the time, right? Uh, hey, it says in the Bible, right? This is what it is. They don't, they don't get that. So um, they don't respond well. He must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. I want you to get this. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? This is the tie together, right? That the family of God in the, in the very beginning form is the extent, the church is the extension of the family, right? And so this is why order in the family creates order in the church. And this is a beautiful thing. But when we see this, um, it really talks about this. He must manage his own family. See that his children obey him. So what it's saying is this, that the most significant indicator of someone who leads other people well in the body of Christ is to be able to say, hey, in the context that they've had from the birth of their children, what does that look like? And we need to understand that every child, every person has their own will, right? And they can respond negatively, and that doesn't always mean that there's a poor parenting job um, that has happened there. But you have to look at that and begin to say, is there a trend there? Is there a pattern there? Do I see something there? Is something, there something that is alarmed? Do their kids all hate them, right? Are they out of control? Do they, have not, they don't have clarity of the worldview of who Jesus is. Did he teach them how to, uh, how to operate in a family? Is this, is this family loving? Does his wife want to submit to his leadership, right? Is she gladly under the, that leadership? Is that, is that a clear thing? Do his kids say, yes, dad, and out of love? Uh, this is the, the thing. Have children that submit to his leadership in a way that is full of respect 
right? So they respect their dad and they submit out of that respect, not out of a heavy handedness, not out of a, a context that says um, there's, there's consequences on the other side of, of that. And not, not kids who's like, I, the minute I can be out of my dad's house, that's going to be the context that I'm going to find freedom. Now, sometimes we have to punish and sometimes it's very difficult and sometimes it's very hard and sometimes it doesn't seem loving to the kid, right? You've been there, right? I've been there. But we look at that and begin to see, hey, that's a picture. Dad is a picture of, uh, of really, in some ways, what that spiritual role is to be to all of us. That spiritual parenting is, is a real thing. And that should be able to be something that helps us to understand that churches are made up of families. Thriving, thriving families make thriving churches because the leadership in one spills over to the leadership in the other. So we go on. It says this, it must not be a... He must not be a recent convert or he might be, become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. This is where anytime you bring in the devil into this kind of context, you're just like, okay, what just happened? We were all just fine and talking about kids and, and minding their parents right that and talking about the church. And all of a sudden we're talking about the, the snares of the devil, right? Or the judgment of the devil. Here's what's happening. Here's what the reality is. Is the sensitivity of saying our souls are being led by someone it is under a context for us to be able to say, okay, if we're in a place where we are ultimately helping people's souls to be um, following after Jesus, then that puts us oftentimes in a very dark place into a, into a context where we're tempted to be able to be cavalier about this. And one of the things I need you to get, if, if you've ever been around someone who's, who's led for a long time, and who's led spiritually for a long time, there's, some, there's sometimes that, uh, and I see it in all of our site pastors, as they go out and they begin to bear the weight of that, um, they just come back, right? And, they, and it's like they've aged two years, like because of the weight of this. And I need you to get, I, I was unprepared 10 years ago when I stepped into the role of pastor of Resonate Church to see just how significant it is when you begin to say, hey, there's, there's an authority and a responsibility that's given towards this. And, and I believe far more people should have this, but it's pointed sometimes at certain leaders. And, uh, and, and I was unaware of just how significant that weight was. And, um, and over the last 10 years, I've, I mean, you can talk to all of our pastors, like there's been beat up moments, right? Where you've just gotten um, socked in the face and you've gotten, not literally, but, but you know, you've just, you've had these moments where you've just got it kind of beat out of you and you realize your ability to do something without God is very little. And to be able to change people's hearts that are dead set on running away from God is really painful. And you go through all of this. And if you don't have in your mind that, that what you're doing is God empowered and not you empowered, then you will be um, uh, just built up and puffed up. And it's saying this, hey, if someone hasn't had the, the, the context of being able to see what it's like to actually bear the weight of leadership, then to put them in the position without having that weight upon them is going to be something that allows them to be reckless in that position. So that is, that's what's, what's talking about this. It says this, he must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. I, don't, I need you to get this. I've been saying this all night long. I need you to get all of it, okay? Just, just, just so we're clear. There's none of this I'm gonna say to you that you're just like, hey, you, you, just, you don't need any of that. Double lives are eventually found out. When you segment your life and say, hey, this is the church me, and this is the me for my family, and this is the me for my work, and this is the me for my classes, and this is the me around my friends that don't go to church, right? I want you to get that that kind of duplicity is always short term. That at some point, who you are and your character is going to be revealed. And so here's what it says. It says he must have a good reputation with outsiders, meaning that you can fool some of the people all the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. So when outsiders look at you, do you have a reputable context to your life? Do you, do you have a good reputation? Are you seen well? Do you carry your weight or is there a duplicity? In this, it says this, that you will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. And that is ultimately one where we begin to believe 
that we can deceive the people around us. Uh, I want to say this. Our sites in Resonate Church that are the healthiest are the sites where that double life has gotten called out the most. We have a few of our sites where these people who are in overseer roles, um, they're not fitting into this, has gotten exposed. And, and it's beautiful because what it does is it deals with that thing and it allows everyone else to say, hey, we're serious about creating a trusting environment in the dynamics of the church so that you can trust them to lead you. And in those places, we've seen more extension of the kingdom of God than anything else. And in the context where we've seen the minimum amount and that stuff gets hidden, that double life, it wars against the presence of God in our context. It wars against the extension of the kingdom of God in our context. Double lives are eventually found out. Here's where we get to see this. And I'm gonna really quickly go through this because we're short on time. But this understanding of not only do we have overseers, but we also have another role in this, and this is, this is deacons. It says this. It says, in the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there's nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. If we were to try to, to understand what this looks like, um, I, I want you to get that... that um, uh, that an overseer, if we were to, to put it this way, an overseer has a leadership that is in more of an authoritarian, uh, an authoritarian kind of thing. And a deacon, if you were to put it this way, this is more of a service to the church. I'm just really oversimplifying this, but I want you to get kind of an understanding of what we're talking about because we've just introduced kind of a new role of leadership and so one is leading people in this way, but uh, the second one is leading across. And so we begin to see in the same way, whoops. So here's we're talking about um, uh, this understanding of who deacons are to be able to serve the church and to be able to use some of the same things as we're seeing in this, right? So there's some of the same characteristics of people that are serving the church and not just um, having an authority or spiritual leadership in the church in that kind of way. And the next one part, we begin to see this as well. We begin to see... Um, in the same way, women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. And this is where we begin to see this, the role of overseer reserved for, uh, for, for the masculine, but the role of deacon, as we see throughout the Bible, we see this in both forms of, of men and women. We begin to see that there's a, there's a role that women begin to play in this part to be able to lead out in serving the church. And, and I think that's an incredible thing. And as I, every time I, I, I talk about this and every time we, we talk through this and begin to say, hey, there's some specific specific things that were given to women in this, that they were to be just the same way, worthy of respect, right, in the same kind of manner, but not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy and everything. And, uh, and, and as I, it, I'm always, I always feel weird to be able to say, um, hey, this is the thing that, ladies, this is said to you, because I can own some of the stuff for guys. Um, but then every time I ask, hey, is this a thing? Like, is this something that, that ladies need to hear? Um, and, and it's always like, yeah, when, when everything goes really wrong, um, the malicious talking is, is one of the things that characterizes uh, in really specific some of the feminine um, manifestations of leadership. So I, I think this is something for us to be able to hear and be able to ask ourselves, is this someone who aspires um, to lead and serve our church in this way? And is there any kind of talk that is coming out of there and begin to say, what am I listening for? Am I listening to them being temperate or am I listening to them being malicious in this? Not only that, it gives some clarity. It says this, a deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household well. So it's the same kind of things as well in that context as well. Um, let me go to this uh, last, last part, verse 13. It has both of these on here. It says this, those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, I want you... Uh, to finally understand this, as we've talked about the dynamics of what it means for us to live in the body of Christ. Um, the last thing is for you to say, I, I want to be a part of this. I, I want to ask you to, to move towards this, the engagement in the body of Christ. And here's what Paul says. He's, he says, those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus, okay? Uh, there, there's a specific thing that happens that when people begin to move and engage God 
as people move towards serving the body of Christ in, in a place of leadership, there's something that happens that enriches your relationship with Jesus. There is something that happens that begins to solidify your relationship with Jesus. And we see this all, all over the place. That Once someone steps into a place of leadership, it's not just giving to the church, but they begin to receive something in their richness of being able to walk with Jesus in a very, a very incredible way. So they begin to have something that is a unique responsibility or a unique, unique experience. And so I, I want you to get this, that God meets you in your place of sacrifice. So maybe it's time. Maybe you give up stuff so that you can serve the church. But here's what Paul says. There's, there's some sort of a connection that you have in the richness of Christ when you begin to serve your church in leadership. So remember, Paul saw first. He's on the road to Damascus, and Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute? And then he uses the word, me. I want you to get more than you're serving the people around you, you're serving in leadership Christ. You're serving your heavenly father. And that should put us in a deep place of humility as we begin to say, this is how I lead out, not because of the people around me, because I may like them, I may not like them, I may be frustrated, but it's because I'm serving Christ in this that drives me in this kind of way. So three, three last responses to this that I wanna ask us to be a part of. One is this, I want us to pray for godly leaders. That our towns and our campuses need people to step up and say, I'm gonna take upon the weight. I'm gonna step into the task of being uh, that noble task of leadership, right? Of being able to, uh, to take and step into saying, hey, I'm gonna leverage my life so that the people around me flourish in Christ. Like that's, that's gonna be what I do with my life. No matter how I succeed in business, no matter how I succeed among my peers, no matter how much money I make, I'm gonna leverage my life so that all the boats around me, the tide rises, right? So when we begin to see this and we begin to say, I'm gonna help the people around me to, to walk towards Christ in a significant way, we need to pray for that. That one of our desires as, as Resonate Church is to be world-class in terms of leadership development. And we believe that um, these college towns are so rich for us to be able to develop leaders that are deployed across the world. And so specifically our church, we need to hear this and we need to be people that are saying, this is what we're looking for. We're sniffing out these kind of people. We're building them up. There's, there's some of you who pray every single day for Christian leaders. Uh, you, your, your prayers will never be more uh, strategic than if you were to say, I'm gonna pray for people to step up into Christian leaders, leadership. So we need to pray for that. We need to pray for our leaders and the temptations, right? So what if you're going to do, if you're, if you're Satan, if you're going to say, hey, I want to take down this church, you're going to take down the leaders. You're going to take down the leaders. So we need to pray for protection for our leaders and pray for more and more and more that we would have a plethora of men who step up and say, I want to, I want to lead out. And the next part of this, this is kind of strange, but this is a beautiful part that you would say, I want to place myself in submission to godly leaders. Here's, here's what I've seen over and over is this. That God has already, in his word, given people around us an assignment towards leadership. If you will agree with God that this is what is right and this is what is good, I think that you're going to see two things. One, when men are given the authority to lead and don't have to claim it or fight for it, they're more likely to operate in benevolent ways towards those that they lead. I just see this, that, that they're loose-handed with that leadership if they're given to that. And, and I watch over and over, when men are given leadership and responsibility, they step into that. But it waits on someone to say, will you lead me? I, I will submit to your leadership. And that might be the gutsiest thing that I've said all night long, is that some of you would say, no matter my church baggage, no matter my past, no matter this, I believe that an ordered God is a God that will ultimately lead to my flourishing in an ordered church. And I would say, hey, I'm, I want to submit. I want to be able to have a heart that's soft towards those around me. It's, it's this. this the, the problem is ultimately that we are really poor at self-leadership. That Around us, there's blind spots. 
And when we can't see the blind spots, we're destined to repeat the same mistakes over and over and over. So if you're saying, why is this sin keep getting me down? Why is this that I can never break out of this thing? It might be because you have a submission issue, not just an obedience issue. And that the people around you can begin to pull out what is ultimately going on in your life and whisper back in the things of truth in a benevolent, benevolent and a loving way that allow you to begin to see yourself in ways that maybe you, don't, you haven't ever seen before. But it takes you saying to someone, you have a right to speak into my life for you to ever eject yourself from the rut that you're in. And if you never allow someone to speak into your life, you might be destined to repeat the same thing over and over and over and never experience the freedom of Christ and never experience the freedom of walking in, in ways that you've never walked before, not lugged down, but by that issue and that sin in your life. So I want to say maybe the most courage, courageous thing for us today is to be able to say, I'm going to submit my life to someone. I'm going to look for them to be a Timothy, a First Timothy 3 kind of, uh, kind of individual, but I'm going to submit my life, and I'm going to look to give leadership of my life to those who have been entrusted with that leadership. And the last thing is this, to step into leadership roles where you see a need. To step into a leadership role as you see a need. For us across this to be people who are stepping into deacon roles and stepping into places where we begin to say, hey, if there's a need, I want to meet that. I want to use my life to be able to, to, to be fashioned towards Christ in that kind of way.